Welcome to the Innovate for Impact podcast. I'm Dan Bentley and I'm joined with Tracy Newman. And today what we're going to talk to you guys about is co-design. So we've we've done a few episodes where we've spoken with, uh, uh, we had a few case studies about co-design. And we've also, we referenced co-design a lot, but Tracy and I were talking the other day and we realized we haven't actually done an episode solely on like what is truly, what is co-design? So we sort of assumed a lot of you guys uh, know what it is and and from a practitioner's perspective, kind of know how it all works. So we thought, well, actually, maybe we should do an episode on that. So that's where we are today. Exactly. Yeah, I think it's it, it'll be fun because it's stuff that we talk about a lot, but I agree. I can't believe that we've missed it this long. Yeah, well, we're going to rectify that today. So that's the good news. So um, yeah, I guess co-design, it's a bit of a buzzword at the moment, Uh you know, you, you've heard us talk about it a lot, but it is broader than that. There are, it's really becoming, uh, you know, a key methodology for this sector uh, in solving problems. Uh, you know, there's, if you look at things like Royal Commissions, uh, you're seeing a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, direction from the outcomes from that around seeing more co-design with people with lived experience and, and not sort of making these decisions on their behalf so that we get it right a lot more. We're seeing even funders um, and even some very traditional funders sort of asking for evidence of co-designing now uh, when we're looking at receiving funding. Um, so it, it's becoming a, a really uh, critical part of the sector. And we talk about it a lot because uh, we, we obviously uh, do a lot of this type of work and we have for a number of years. But it, it really is a great way to solve problems. And um, we are going to talk about it today. But... I think one of the challenges with it is being that for some people it is new. We are seeing all sorts of different levels of understanding uh, and because it is being asked, especially in the aged care space, uh, for people to, to participate and do this, we're seeing it um, sometimes maybe not being implemented in, uh, in, in the true spirit of what it's all about. So we want to sort of go through that with you today. We're going to talk about, well, what is co-design really beyond the buzzword? Uh, what does it truly mean? Uh, I guess we're going to take you through our process on how we co-design with our clients when we're working on projects with them. And yeah, I guess we're, we, we've got a bit of a case study as well that we're going to take you through to, to sort of bring it to life because I think that's what's important. I think we, it's pretty easy for us to sit there and, and listen to um, some some principles and some tools and go, that sounds great. But, you know, we all know that you're out there having to implement this stuff. And so we feel like putting a case study alongside of it um, will hopefully make that a lot easier for you to, to bring that to life and make that a bit more practical. Yeah, it's always easier to, to do something the first time when you've seen how someone else has done it, isn't it? All right. So uh, let's let's talk a bit about it, Trace. So uh, look, you're normally pretty good at explaining things like this. So I'm going to chuck it to you. But what what is co-design? Well, really what co-design is, is just simply it's a creative approach to problem solving. So it's about uh, getting the people that you're designing for um, and getting them together and, and building up that really deep understanding and actually uh, in, like involving them in each of the steps so that you're actually designing together with the people that you are looking to support with the thing that you are designing. So it's, it's essentially just designing with the people that you're designing for. I was going to pull you up on that because at the start you did say getting the people together that you're designing for. And I was like, well, is that actually co-design? What is it? If you are, if you're designing for a group of people versus designing with a group of people, is that co-design or is that something else? Or? Yeah. I mean, look, um, and quite often you, you, there are lots of different terms that you hear. So, you know, you, you, people will hear co-design, um, but you also um, might have heard of human-centred design. And essentially the difference between co-design and human-centred design is co-design is designing with the people uh, and human-centred design is designing with input from the people that you're designing for. So that's, you know, it's, it's almost down to a two-word difference, but a significant difference in terms of people's participation. 
And I think the, I mean, the other things that people, you know, are probably hearing about and not quite sure how it all fits. Um, co-design is sometimes also called participatory design. It's the same thing. Um, and then also uh, people talk about design thinking, which is essentially just a mindset that underpins all the different types of design. And, and it's really about, you know, having that idea, that um, mindset where you're open to learning and you're really curious and you're testing things as you go, um, you know, creating small small interventions, testing them, refining them, and then improving it from there. And it's it's about having that learner's kind of mindset. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. And I guess let's talk a little bit now about like what sort of problems is co-design good for solving? Yeah, well, um, it, so you probably, hear, again, terms that you've heard, uh, a, a common sort of phraseology when you're thinking about problems is wicked problems and standard problems. And I guess the difference between a wicked problem and a standard problem is a wicked problem is uh, it's not really something that's defined or definable uh, and it's not really something that's solvable. So when you're thinking about wicked problems, they're problems that have got multiple different causes and you can't just kind of pick up a solution and impose it over the the top and always get the, the same outcome. Whereas um, a standard problem, even even a really complex and detailed standard problem has kind of a known solution. And if you continue to do those things, you'll always get to, to the known outcome. Come. So I guess an example of a complex standard problem might be rebuilding a city after an earthquake. You know, it, it's not easy, but uh, provided you follow the plans and, you know, get the architects involved and build the houses, eventually you'll rebuild the city. Whereas, you know, if you're thinking about a wicked problem, that's more likely to be something along the lines of, well, you know, how do we solve homelessness? Well, there's many different um, factors that come into play and you've got to think about, you know, the community and um, the people involved. And so therefore you can't just sort of pick up a solution that's worked somewhere else, put it down over the top and you'll solve that problem. And it's also uh, really good as well for for solving some certain types of like operational type challenges or strategic challenges that you might have as an organization. So for example, uh, if you're looking to improve one of your services or a program that you're running, or even if you're wanting to launch a new program or service, it's a fantastic tool for that because what it enables you to do is get all of those different stakeholders together that either are using or maybe going to be using what it is you're looking to improve or create and getting there all of their unique perspectives. And when you do that, you can really understand it from multiple angles and truly understand what's going on. Whereas when you might have just organizational data or uh, organizational opinion, you're missing quite often a lot of the pieces of the puzzle. The other one is too, is from a strategic perspective, uh, is it's also can be really quite useful as well, because um, again, if you're getting all those different people that are within the system involved in understanding that the challenges and the problems and then getting that group to move through and and look at ways to uh, solve it or or if it's a wicked problem maybe not solve it but actually make it better um, then what you're actually going to get is you're going to get a uh, you're going to, it's going to be a lot clearer on what your options are and the, and you're going to have confidence in the direction that you're going to head in because you've gone through that process with everybody um, and obviously as well the other big thing that's a it's a real benefit of this approach is that you're bringing people on the journey. I think that's one of the most important things too, is that when people have told this is why we're doing something and this is how, how we're doing it, it's quite often like a little bit hard. It's a lot harder effort to sort of get people on board with that. Whereas if people have been involved in that and people know that people like them have had a voice in its, its, in its creation, it's also a hell of a lot easier to get things like that across the line and get buy-in and, and usage and all those sorts of things too. Oh, absolutely. I think we've all had that experience, haven't we, where someone's given you something and said, you know, now go and do this. And you've looked at it and gone, you know, if you'd have just asked me, I could have told you that if you do this slightly differently, it'll be faster and more accurate and easier. And, you know, so we've all kind of had that experience and really co-design is, is um a, a great way to avoid that happening. Um, and, you know, really move everybody towards being um, much more sort of involved and proactive. 
Um, some of the other things. So, you know, when we talk about co-design, um, I think everybody kind of gets that, um, you know, what it is and, and how it's helpful and what it's uh, helpful for. But there are some other pieces that kind of sit alongside co-design that we find are really also quite important. Um, and that is things like uh, system thinking, um, which is really uh, all about actually having a look at, you know, the what it is that we're dealing with, not just what does that look like on, on an individual basis, but how does that actually operate in the, the the place that that operates, I guess. So what are the other systems that sit around it and what are the other pieces that um, are involved with it? Uh, and again, this is um, where co-design can sort of help to bring that to life, but it's important to sort of think at that systemic level rather than just at that individual level because um, at a system level, things can operate differently from how they operate individually. I always like to share uh, this kind of story about uh, the cane toad. And, you know, if you if you think about the cane toad being introduced to eat the cane beetle, um, it did that. So therefore, at an individual level, it was successful. But if you think about it at a system level, um, you know, the, de- the rest of the damage that the cane toad has done to the system that it lives in, um, you wouldn't say that it's successful. So I think that's a really important term that you 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 kind of see and and factor and think about alongside co-design as well and then some of the other uh things that are really important alongside co-design and the main one is power dynamics so you know there are power dynamics that exist you know between parents and children or between you know um somebody who's providing funding and the person who's the recipient of that funding all those different power dynamics exist and i think it's important to consider when you're co-designing like how can you work effectively with those power dynamics so that you're not inadvertently exacerbating existing power dynamics and actually giving people an equal voice and allowing them to participate in a way that's meaningful for them. Um, and that participation, I guess, is is what really uh, determines kind of your success of your co-design project. So um, the quality of your co-design project is really driven by how you can support meaningful participation by the most diverse range of people who are actually going to be part of you know, what it is that you're that you're working on or part of your project. So, you know, thinking about things like, you know, um, pr- like looking at the access and, um, you know, even just your physical participation, but also ways that you can really invite people in and, and have them feel like they can meaningfully be a part of your co-design project. Yeah. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is uh, take you through what our process is but whilst we are going through that too, we're actually going to use a bit of a case study uh, that we did uh, a while ago. And it's um, with Australian Multicultural Community Services. And it was a project that we did, which was looking at how might we be able to assist people with dementia that speak English as their second language to stay connected with their community so that they avoid social isolation. So um, yeah, like we said at the start, we can give you all the theory in the world like we just have. We totally get that's a lot of information, but you're probably want, you're wanting to know how do you actually implement this in and make a difference. So that's what we're going to go through with you at the same time. So like this, so um, when we work with organisations, we have, uh, I guess, a five-step uh, process um, and then within each of those steps there's different activities that, that we consider and different activities that we do. So um, that process, the first the first step is all is define and align, which is making sure that we're really clear about you know what is the problem that we're looking on looking at what are the sort of boundaries how can we align all of the different stakeholders and how can we you know factor in things like power dynamics and participation to really set the whole project up for success and then we move on to you know building that really rich understanding so the next the next stage is called understand uh, and that's where we look at the problem with all those different sort of perspectives and then under, you know, building off of that understanding, we then move into sort of creating and testing ideas, which is where, you know, leveraging that voice of uh, of the different stakeholders, we 
together will then look at some different ideas, pull out the best ideas and test them. And then once we've done that testing and refining, the next stage is implement. So that's where we actually turn that in into kind of life um, and actually implement what it is that we've created. And then the very last one, but also significance significantly important is all about delivering impact so that's you know the the purpose of the the whole piece of work which is actually where we make sure that we're actually um you know delivering the impact that we were looking to do and continuously learning through that evaluation piece so if we go back to that uh the start and the define and align like as i said that's where we we sort of define the problem and um make sure that the the we're really setting the project up for success. And, um, you know, with the with the case study that Dan mentioned before, we had to do quite a bit of work around that because we were work. the case study that we were looking at was how might we assist people who are living with dem- dementia to, to stay connected into the community. Define and align, that's where we, we make sure that we define the problem. We, we do uh, things like system mapping, um, we, we engage the stakeholders, we have a look at who they are and we, we go through that process to make sure that we're facilitating participation in the most meaningful way for our diverse group of stakeholders. So when we were doing that with the case study that you mentioned before, Dan, what were some of the things that we need to consider there? Yeah, so we needed to, first of all, think about, well, how are we going to get the right people and who were the right people is probably a, is a good starting point. So we needed to sort of do some sort of stakeholder mapping, understanding um, who who was it in the community? Um, how could we make sure we had the right people coming to be uh, involved? One of the things that can happen with these types of projects is that you can quite often get a bunch of extroverted supporters of your organization coming along and they're not necessarily holding the views or the typical service user or, you know, person with lived experience that you're trying to, uh, to find out more about. So first step was let's understand who are the different communities, what are the types of people and how could we really make sure that we were going to get, um, different, like the right types of people to turn up to this series of workshops that we were running. So we did that. We used um, a lot of the organization's existing relationships with leaders in those communities that we wanted to have involved. And they were able to find some really diverse participants for us to be able to to get involved and be able to sort of use their relationship to be able to uh, encourage them to come along and and be involved in in this particular project. Uh, The other thing that we needed to do too was start to think about, well, if we did have all these people coming along, how the hell are we going to be able to get everybody to be able to participate in a way that was useful for the project, but also at the same time useful for uh, them and and also like a nice experience for them to be involved. Some uh, considerations that we had was that a number of people would be speaking uh, English as their second language. Um, And also we had to consider as well that there was a number of people that were living with dementia um, and people obviously experienced that in different ways. So we spent a bit of time working with some resources from Dementia Australia to try and uh, get a bit of a checklist, I guess, on how we could create dementia-friendly spaces and dementia-friendly activities. And so some of the things that we looked at there, for example, was like the lighting and the setup of the room was really important to somebody being able to participate, making sure that we didn't use things like a projector or that the lighting was consistent or even the way that we set up the tables for the workshop was in like a U shape rather than being in, you know, having people sort of speaking behind you and to the side of you. They, it was really important um, that it was everybody was in uh whoever was speaking was in the periphery of whoever was listening um, just to stop people from feeling disorientated. So there were a number of different things like that in terms of the language, potential language barriers. We did have um, different ways people could participate. I think that's one of the big tips that we give people with co-design is you can't necessarily uh, understand every single thing, but if you go in there with a flexible mindset and you have multiple ways people can participate that can, and you, and you're willing to be flexible on the spot and think and ask people, what, what do they need to participate? That's quite often a good mindset to have. And that's what we did with this. We, we did have uh, translators uh, on hand. We had people that could, um, you know, speak and someone would write on their behalf if they weren't comfortable writing. We had also the opposite of that. Um, we used uh, as much as possible. We just tried to make things easy and accessible for anyone that was going to participate. So using images as well as words, uh, using minimal 
text or, um, you know, just make things as, as easy. we just tried to communicate the best way that we could so that no matter who was there would be able to participate really well. Yeah, and I think that's a, um, you know, it, you, you're not expected to know everything and it's always great to just check in with people. It makes a big difference. So um, I guess the purpose of that is that moving on to kind of our next step, which is all about building up that understanding. So, you know, we want to kind of collect information from uh, from people using different types of methods. So you mentioned workshops, so that's one of the methods that we that we use. Um, and I know quite often when you talk about workshops, people uh, sorry, you talk about co-design, people naturally start to think about workshops. But there are other methods that we use here as well. So interviews. So interviews are often really powerful because it gives you the ability to um, you know collect information from people and sort of go a little bit deeper into that conversation piece. And again, you know, sometimes that's a group a group interview within a, a workshop or sometimes it's one-on-one -on -one and then you're sharing that information back to the rest of the co-design team. Um, but then, you know, there are other things like observations where you're actually watching what people do and, again, you know, sort of sharing that information back because uh, sometimes what people think they do and, and tell you that they do isn't necessarily the same as what, you know, what they do and when you're actually watching them. And then the other piece that we also can use to build up that shared understanding is things like photo journals and diaries. So that allows for people to collect information over a longer period of time. You know, if you were looking to, I don't know, improve somebody's morning routine, well, you might get them to share, you know, what's the first thing they do each day for a month or something like that. And of course, getting someone to remember that's quite difficult. So that's where, you know, you would use that information and then yep, share that across the co-design team. So what, what were some of the things that we did within the case study around building that understanding? Yeah, so uh, we ran a number of different activities. One of them was looking at what, what a day in the life of can look like for uh, both the carer and also somebody living with dementia. Uh, so we, we ran an activity where we had like an A3 piece of paper and it had sort of like all the hours of a day sort of set out and they went through and, and participated by either telling somebody what that looks like on an average day or even writing that down themselves. And then as a group, we're able to come together and understand as a group, what can some, some different types of days for people look like? What of those days were moments that were good moments and what were maybe some of those moments that were challenging and you know, like what Tracy said before, when you, you're looking at uh, getting people to share these stories, the purpose of doing that is to increase the group's understanding of different perspectives. And so it's really important that, you know, the difference between like human-centered design and co-design is that like human-centered design, there's probably like a central project team, usually from the service provider or something like that, who is just like piecing together information. Whereas with co-design, what you really want is you want lots of people that are all part of it to hear each other's stories. Because what that does is it helps the entire group understand the picture more holistically rather than just from their own perspective as well, which is just is a really important piece. Um, and then we did another exercise as well where we had people tell their stories. So it was almost like a group interview and we spoke about how they are or how they aren't or maybe even how they'd like to be involved with different parts of their local their, their community um, and were able to sort of grab a lot of those insights from those groups after we did that storytelling and be able to sort of piece together some themes that came out of days in the life of and also that storytelling that were enable us to then create these really great ideas out of that. And I think what was really great about it was when we did this particular workshop is we had a very diverse group of participants. So we had people with lived experience from the different communities. I think there was about four or five different communities from inner west um, of, of Melbourne um, involved. And we also had though, and we also had their carers there as well, but we also had people from the service provider that we're working with and we had uh, people from like Carers Victoria, Dementia Australia, um, some um, in-home aged care, other in-home aged care service providers, some residential aged care service providers. We had like there was a whole heap of people that worked in that system. And so when we had these storytelling sessions, people were sort of maybe the person with lived experience would tell the story and say, "Oh, you know, I had this particular." Um, Thing that happens to me and I, this is what happens when I want to be in part of the community and somebody else comes in and goes, you know what, I'm working with a, a bunch of people that have that same experience and what they are finding is this. And you're kind of just building up this 
this understanding as a group and it's, and it's really powerful and you, you do at the end of it, like I said, have these rich insights that you can then take forward to then go, right, it's really clear to us now what the challenges are for everybody. We've got it from so many different perspectives. Now let's take it to that next step. And that next step is all about creating and testing the, those ideas. When we think about like creating and testing ideas, um, the first focus is all about creating those ideas. So we use a, a range of different methods to be able to do that. So we do like rapid ideation where people will just sit quietly and write down some ideas. And then we move into brainstorming, which is all about um, you know, getting as many ideas as possible and really building up the energy of the group and everyone sharing those ideas. And so you can get as many ideas as possible. And then following that, what we then do is we we then have a look at those ideas. We get everybody to um, tell us what, what the most desirable idea is. So, you know, what's going to have the most impact? What's their favourite idea? And after we've sort of um, looked at like what is what are the most desirable ideas and sort of filtered down the the ideas through that lens we then have a think about well what's going to be really sustainable and what's going to be uh, really viable so what can we implement and what can we do in a way that's ongoing and the ideas that are the most desirable the most sustainable and the most viable are the ones that we then move into uh, and and do that testing on but um when we're thinking about creating ideas, it's all about creating as many as possible and then filtering those ideas down. Yeah. And I probably don't have too much to add from that project's perspective around what we did, but I'll just give a quick understanding. It's very similar to what you just said. That's why um, we essentially did get everybody to quietly come up with a number of different ideas. So sorry, a step back. We came up as a group, we decided on these are the kind of key themes that we want and problems that we have that we need to solve. And we're able to come up with sort of like some guiding principles and, and, and that sort of thing and frame the problem a bit better. And then what we're able to do then as a team was then spend some time quietly just thinking about some solutions and then sharing those solutions as a group. People were able to put them up on the wall and um, talk them through. And the most important thing with this process is that everybody has equal power in the, in the, putting their idea forward. Um, we hear everybody's idea out. Uh, then it, once we've got them all there and people have considered them, like Tracy said before, people would start to go well, like, you know what, this idea here, I think for me that I, that would solve my problem or from what we've talked about before, I think that's going to solve the overarching problem that we're trying to look at. And then we were able to move through those models. And I think we came up with about five different ideas that were both desirable and we're going to have the desired impact that we're looking for. They're also sustainable for the organization to be able to um, create and, and manage ongoing and also possible for them to be able to create in the first place with the resources that they have, which is a really you know good balanced idea, which is what you're looking for. Sure is. And then when we've sort of narrowed that down, we then take, you know, a few ideas and we test them. So the first sort of step in that testing process is we want to make, we want to take our idea from being, you know, a couple of words on a post-it to something that's really tangible for people. So we want to be able to create a prototype. There's a few different types of prototypes that you would then create. And of course, it depends on what it is that that your idea is. You know, obviously, if it's about a, a technology solution then you know you might want to draw out what the different screens and you know create a wireframe or if it's a a, a service you know you might um then want to draw out like a storyboard sort of showing how that would all fit together um we we find role plays are actually really great when we're talking about our service again because people can actually watch the interaction and it really helps them to kind of go oh like okay, oh, i can see what that would look like now and then they can give you give you that feedback because when you're um so you know you want to create a prototype that sort of brings your idea to life and and helps the people who are uh, creating that prototype to really flesh out that idea. But then you also want to take that and test it with people outside of the co-design group because what happens is when you're involved in co-design, you know, optimism bias kicks in and, and you know, everybody falls in love with the ideas and they know what you're, you're out to achieve. So then you want to be able to test that with people outside of the organization 
outside of the co-design team so that you can get that additional feedback before you then go and and get ready to launch. So when you're looking to test those ideas, there are different sort of ways that you can kind of test that. But essentially, you want to get your prototype, put it into the hands of the people who are going to be using it and get their feedback and then take their feedback and improve your product before you go to the next stage, which is implement. Yeah. The only, other, the only other thing I'll add on top of what Trace just said there too is that when you are, like when you're thinking about an idea, when it is just a few lines on a post-it note and, you know, a few people like have, have started talking about it, it's still in its very, very early days as an idea. It's not until you have to then make a storyboard or, or act it out as a role play that the entire group really needs to start thinking about, well, no, what does this actually look like when it's implemented? And so that's the other benefit of it there's some people that run co-design and they actually skip this step and because they think well we've got the people in the room and that's we 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 don't we've just learned this from our experience that like for all the reasons tracy and i've just mentioned this is a really important step to continue to to keep in a co-design process because yeah those people in the room like tracy said they, they know so much information now it, and they and they and they look at they're looking at the problem from the perspective of being highly educated on that problem by the time you get to this point that idea needs to still work for someone who doesn't understand the problem in its entirety. They're just dealing with it from their individual's perspective. And that's why testing is very, very important. But in this project that we did back to the case study, we, we used a number of different methods. We had, um, we had it, we broke up into a couple of different groups. And what we did was, is we assigned, a, 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 well, they assigned themselves a problem each that they wanted to, um, uh, I guess, sorry, a solution each, my bad. They've signed themselves a solution each that they wanted to work on. And what they um, came up with was um, one of the teams did like a brochure that they wanted to uh, get in the hands of um, some, some medical professionals that they think would help people better understand dementia and how people could stay connected to the community. Uh, and another group uh, that uh, was, 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 was fantastic to see what they did. They did this role play of... Uh, their service and how it would work. And essentially what the service was, was it was, a, 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 it was AM, AMCS, the organization that we did the project with, offering some culturally appropriate, however, dementia-friendly events. Because the one of the insights that they got from people as we went through the understand phase was that there was culturally appropriate events that you could go to so that you could go down to your local, you know, if you're from the Croatia community, you can go through to, down to your local Croatia club, right? But, as their dementia started becoming more and more, I guess um, it was affecting them more and more, they found that they couldn't really participate there anymore because they weren't necessarily set up as dementia-friendly ex- environments and other people there weren't necessarily experiencing the same sorts of things where, as they said, well, if we had events where it was dementia-friendly and they were offered by the organisation and plus there was transport that could take us there and get us there on time, which was another insight that they found that with the current stuff uh, that was available, wasn't working for them that we would absolutely love to be a part of that and it could help us to still be a part of our community so that's what they came up with as the idea so this group thought well a role play is the best way to do that and they used a number of different things like um, some toy cars and some plasticine and all these different tools that we had to sort of bring these things to life and they acted this idea out and what was really powerful about it was is that in that moment there was two other groups that hadn't been a part of that idea and and didn't hadn't thought it through to that level and they were able to give them some immediate feedback to make their idea even better by saying well look you know at this point you send me a letter at the start but then you tell me to go online why can, why do i have to go online why is it wasn't there another way that i could that i could organize for myself to be picked up and go to one of these events and they were like oh we hadn't thought about that that was just the way that we sort of implemented it in our head so that like i said they're able to get some really good feedback early and then what they're able to do then is actually take all of that build out a, a a more higher fidelity prototype, like a prototype that they could then go and show to people outside of the organization who weren't a part of this particular uh, project and these workshops, which was, you know, then they could get even richer feedback from there. So there's, there's, usually, yeah, there's usually a few different outcomes that you get when you do test with people. And quite often is that you're on the right track, but you've got to make a few sort of tweaks before you launch. Um, 
But sometimes as well, and we've done a project on this a while ago where an organization was going to invest a whole heap of resources in creating this particular program and they got us in kind of pretty late to sort of to test that idea and sort of understand whether that was going to be a winner and we found out that uh, it, it, it wasn't. So um, that is what we call an efficient failure. So you work out you know, not where not to spend your time and money by going down a certain path. You can actually work out a better way to use those resources so that you get it right. And then finally, the one that's probably the least um, you know, likely to happen at this early stage is that you got it perfectly right. You know, it does happen sometimes, but it's not, um, it's not, usually you've got a few tweaks you need to make because, you know, that's, there's, there's only been a, still quite a small subsection of the community that has been involved in that co-design at this point. And once you get it out there and get it to a wider group, they usually have some pretty good feedback for you on how you can make it even better. Yeah, and, qu- and quite often the feedback is really simple and very effective. So um, absolutely a big proponent of, of going out and testing more broadly and, and getting that feedback before you go to the next stage, which is where you actually turn that concept into a proposal or, um, you know, maybe you need to put together a business case or uh, we also have uh, another document that we use, which is a concept on a page. So, um, and those things actually then help you to implement or bring to life what it is that you're co-designing. So um, the concept on a page I find is really helpful because it it helps you to draw out, well, what what in this solution is unique and what in this solution isn't covered anywhere else, but it also gets you to draw out, well, are there, are there any remaining gaps? So that then also means that, you know, it, it sets you up for, you know, future iterations or future successes, or at least it makes sure that, you know, you're not duplicating uh, effort that's being done somewhere else. And also you're aware of, you know, where are, where are the sort of remaining gaps in, in terms of this solution? solution if if there are any so that you've got a good place to start next time Um, and through actually taking that feedback making those changes and then implementing then obviously that's where you get the the real success of all of the hard work that you've done up to that point and that's where you can really bring that to life and make sure that you are delivering on that impact that's really going to change change things for people and is really going to make that different. This is where you start thinking about, all right, is there any operational risk or wider risk to the organization by going down this path? And that concept on a page kind of helps draw that out. Another little tip as well, give around implementation is, is that this is where as well, that when you're doing this in an organization, especially if the organization is new to working in this way, um, or even if it's just not, you know, there's probably a bunch of people that haven't been involved in this project. This is where you start sort of start bringing it into the wider organization. And a little tip that we found over the years of doing this type of work is that using the existing project planning or business cases and proposals format and templates that the organization work and start using, start filling some of those types of documents out and using the that sort of thing can be really beneficial because it starts make it starts making it easier for you to communicate with other people in the organization that maybe weren't part of the project. And that's because it's in a format that they're used to. So, and it's, you know, it's a, it's following the internal process, but you've just basically spent this other bit of time before that really sort of getting um, all of that together, if that makes sense. So you can almost look at that start of the process that we've just sort of been through as being, you know, that's how you've designed and created it. But this is this point where you start sort of bringing it back into some of your existing ways of working so that the organization is, it's easy for them to understand what you've done and also take it on board and implement it. Nice. Yeah. And of course, the reason why you want to do that is because you really want to deliver impact, which is the last stage, which is all about continuously learning through evaluation and that continuous improvement to make sure that you are delivering on uh, what it is that that the entire project was set up for. Um, But And, you know, when we talk about um, evaluation, the type of evaluation that we most commonly sort of uh, talk about or refer to people is developmental evaluation, because that actually uh, aligns, we feel really well with co-design, because you're continuously learning and involving the people who are, you know, using your services or products in understanding, you know, how is this working for you now? What's really important to you? Do we need to continue to adjust it or, um, you know, and make sure that it continues to adapt to those sort of changing new uh, needs of the people that you actually 
uh, had involved in the co-design project in the beginning and the people that you're looking to support on in an ongoing way. So there you have it. That's kind of our five stages. Define and align, understand, create and test ideas, implement and then deliver impact. So <laughs> with with another tip as well is that um, when you are looking at evaluating, coming up with some of those ideas around from the, from the people that you have involved in the co-design project uh, at the very start when you're in that define and align, it can be really good to start thinking about and asking people, what are some of the outcomes that you would need to see to know that this has been solved or is better? And then using those outcomes as part of your building your framework for your evaluation is also a really effective way of doing that. So then you can use the bit that Tracy said before that, mainly that's okay. Sorry, I'm making you do a bit of chopping today. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's our process. Um, yeah, we use this a, a lot. We've, uh, we, we're consistently, you know, looking at what other methods and processes that can, and uh, can be put into that to sort of, to make it sort of best practice. But, um, yeah, hopefully that, uh, case study sorry delete that bit i don't know what i was saying there let me just say let me say that again so that's our that's our process um we use this on a, a number of different projects really hoping that that case study was able to help you to bring that to life the outcomes of that particular project was that, that service provider was able to go and test further test some ideas that um, came out of that workshop and then uh, look at implementing that but they also were able to have a whole bunch of insights they're able to use by going around and um, doing some I guess sort of like road shows and educating some of the other service providers that work in the system that they operate in around some of those unique needs that the people from these communities that are living with dementia and their carers actually have and further use that information that they learned from being a part of this process to help other providers to deliver even better services as well. So it was, um, yeah, a great project, but yeah, hopefully that helped you to um, bring it to life and understand how you could maybe use it in your organization. So um, yeah, that's it. Trace, did you have anything else you wanted to mention? No, I'm all done for today. Thanks. Awesome. That was a long one, but yeah, hopefully that was helpful for everybody. And um, yeah, we've brought that to life and help you understand a bit more around what does co-design actually look like. So uh, thanks for joining us today and we'll catch you all on our next episode. Thanks.